When you start to work in pricing, you quickly realize how important price elasticities are when it comes to making good pricing decisions. That then leads to the question, how do you measure price elasticities? In this video, I'll share some frequent methods and sources to uncover willingness to pay and measure elasticities. I'm Philip Daus, thank you for joining. There are both external and internal sources to assess price elasticity. I will cover six of them. Let's start with the internal sources. Number one, expert judgment. The first source is expert judgment, which can be collected in the form of stakeholder interviews, internal surveys, and workshops. While internal experts tend to have good understanding of products, customers, and markets, their knowledge about price elasticities tends to be limited. One way to gauge price demand curves and get proxies for price elasticities is by using a workshop-based approach called price strut. In a price strut workshop, internal stakeholders and market experts are asked to estimate how volumes would react in case of price changes. For example, participants would share their volume estimates for a 5%, a 10%, and a 15% price increase, as well as for a price decrease of the same magnitudes. In effect, each participant is sharing their own expectations for a price demand curve, and the results can then be openly discussed in a group setting, which often reveals insights about customer segments and competitors. In a more advanced version of price strat, competitive reactions to price changes are contemplated as well to understand the overall impact on elasticities. Number two, historical data. Historical data typically includes product data, customer data, transaction data, and data about product usage. In my projects, Historical data analysis is typically at the very core of our activities as it helps to develop hypotheses on customer needs, value drivers, willingness to pay, and other pricing relevant information. However, when it comes to measuring actual price elasticities, using historical data has its limitations. For example, data sets need to contain past price changes to be able to investigate volume changes. So if a company has not changed prices for years, it's impossible to tease out elasticities. Also, data can be very noisy and volume changes can be impacted by pricing actions of competitors, promotional activities, custom and product mix effects, etc. The biggest limitation typically is that historical data can only shed light on price changes that happened in the past, but they only provide limited insights into potential impact of future price changes. Number three, desk research. A third internal source for pricing analysis is desk research. At Simon Kutcher, for example, we have a database of thousands of case studies and pricing studies that allow us to find pricing benchmarks and identify typical elasticities for a given industry. Desk research can also reveal additional market and competitor data indicating how volumes react when prices change. While internal sources are typically a relevant and a fast and cheap way to get pricing data, it's advisable to use external sources for more robust understanding of elasticities. Number four, qualitative market research. One key external source is qualitative market research. Through interviews and focus groups in which special questioning techniques are applied, one can assess custom and prospect needs, importance of value drivers, competitive performance, value to customer, and ultimately willingness to pay. This information can be used to establish price elasticity proxies. While this is a very useful method, particularly in B2B settings, due to the lower sample size, results are a little bit less robust and need to be contemplated together with other sources. Number five, quantitative market research.
probably the most robust source for pricing analysis is quantitative market research. Market surveys with dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of customers can yield a profound understanding of price elasticity that covers not only past price moves, but that tests future price changes as well. Surveys may include both direct and indirect methods to measure willingness to pay and price elasticity. A few examples for direct methods are Van Westendorp, which is a tool to measure acceptable price ranges and price thresholds, Garber Granger, or constant sum questions. More sophisticated surveys include indirect methods, such as conjoint measurement. In conjoint analysis, respondents are not asked directly for their reactions to price changes. Instead, conjoint measures individuals' preferences for products and for product attributes by a systematic variation of these attributes. The underlying assumption is that the value of a product can be derived from the combination of its inherent product attributes, such as price. Without going into details here or getting too technical, conjoints force respondents to make very tough trade-off decisions to reveal true preferences and utility values for each product attribute, which can then get translated into price elasticities. When done well, conjoints are a very reliable tool to model the impact of future price changes. However, they're rather complex to set up, they are expensive, and when done incorrectly, the garbage in garbage out principle holds. Number six, price tests and pilots. The last source to measure elasticities are price tests and market pilots. They can either refer to price changes that are temporary and rolled out to all customers for a limited period of time, but they can also refer to permanent price changes that are rolled out to confined group of customers in isolation. For example, to test markets, user panels, specific segments, etc. In both cases, it's necessary to have a control group of customers that reflect exactly the characteristics of the pilot group to be able to measure elasticities. When using pilots, the rule of thumb is to change one variable at a time and design different pilots to test different variables. So while pilots are very reliable and they're also a very useful way to measure elasticities, as only one variable can get tested at a time, they're of limited use when it comes to testing many price points as control groups become smaller and less reliable. In summary, there's a variety of methods and sources to measure price elasticities that all have their advantages and their disadvantages. It should be said that there's not one source or one methodology that is ideal for measuring elasticities by itself. Therefore, best-in-class companies triangulate results from a mix of sources and methods to derive insights and drive pricing recommendations. How does your company measure price elasticities? What methods have you worked with? What are some of your learnings from applying different methods? Let me know in the comments. If you like this content, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching. If you like this content, click like, subscribe, and for more great pricing videos, check out the rest of our YouTube page.